Well, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. My name is Jessica Dooley, and I will talk about this project, as Warner mentioned, um, a custom caching server um, using Nginx and how I used NPR digital services teams write up of their bot cache project to as a template to protect Drupal websites from bot traffic. Um, this is an operations talk, basically. My background is operations, and I uh, spent a number of years as an IT generalist. And I really, what I really enjoy about being a generalist is that you you have hands on with all um, phases of an IT service, from planning it and designing it through implementation and through support. Um, I find that really satisfying just because of the, the process improvement aspect. You're able to, to accept feedback from your end users and sort of bake that in as you iterate in the future. I've really enjoyed attending the Cryo Linux Fest over, over the last few years, and I've gotten a lot of, of encouragement and ideas um, from, from listening to the presenters. So a big, big thank you to the whole team um, and to the sponsors for making sure that Ohio Linux Fest was able to continue this year in a virtual form. Um, so where did this project come from? Um, last year, I took a role as a Linux infrastructure specialist with an uh, organization here in Columbus. We're a small team that focuses primarily on internet and network services, but we also provide some bespoke Drupal websites. And uh, we have a web developer who is product owner for those websites, and I inherited responsibility for the hosting aspect. Um, so for a sense of scale, uh, we've got 80 customer websites and um, they are informational and they're primarily they're primarily serving anonymous views so they're not you know people aren't creating user accounts they're not e-commerce um, they're being served on a, a lamp stack so a linux flavor with apache and mysql and php um, and for a sense of scale they see about twenty one thousand unique visitors a day but they have a problem um, so on a regular basis our monitoring would fire off an alert for a degradation of performance uh, on these websites. There would be a big spike in requests that would cause high resource utilization to the point that the website's performance would suffer and they would slow or the server might even become unresponsive. Um, and these are not organic spikes from, from customers um, or actual, actual users visiting the site. They're, they're essentially bot traffic. A web crawl, um, a researcher, maybe a security scan. They'll have a user agent like Python crawler, or maybe it'll be 12 um, adjacent IP addresses that are registered to a cloud hosting provider. And they're just kind of hammering the website with requests for um, older content. They're essentially crawling the whole site. And that traffic is impacting the availability and the performance of the websites. And that's far from optimal. That's not ideal at all. I really don't want that to happen. Um, it shouldn't be possible. So what can I do to make that not happen? Um, I could throw more system resources at the problem, but that's not a good answer. It costs more and I don't need all of those system resources all of the time. And if I use an auto scaling solution, I don't think I'm seeing a business return on investment uh, on that because I'm just feeding those extra CPU cycles to bots. Um, and we're already using, you know, some some basic measures like fail to ban with rate limiting or tweaking tweaking the Apache configuration, but it's not enough to solve this problem. So that's the the question I'm asking. How can I more effectively serve this type of dynamic web content to anonymous visitors? Um, so when I started asking that question, this is uh, the post that I found. I found a write up uh, published in 2014 by Rick Ennis an SRE with National Public Radio's digital services team uh, called Hardening Drupal Against Badly Behaved Bots. And surprise Pikachu face is an unironic depiction of my delight <laughs> reading this, because this sounds exactly like the problem that I'm having. And they're describing just, you know, in a, in a sort of a conversational way, the architecture that they built to deal with that and how it protected their suite of Drupal websites from this type of traffic. So that's very exciting. Um, sounds like the solution I need, but I have a number of questions. Obviously, this write-up was created by a team of SREs at a, at a larger organization. So um, 
and, and this is a post, it's a blog post, you know, it's not a cookbook. So can I, can I replicate this? Um, are they using Nginx community edition features or are they using the commercial edition? Are they writing a, a bespoke project here that, that I won't be able to replicate? Um, can I scale this down and can I customize it to fit the needs of my organizations? Um, how can I measure the impact that implementing this project would have? Is it really going to solve my problem? And of course, when you're looking at any new idea, what else do I not know to ask? So to answer this question, I decided to treat this write-up that they published uh, like a template, like a cookbook, and try to recreate their exact design in a sandbox. So that I could discover whether that was possible and whether it would be a good fit for our organization and then benchmark and see, you know, try to replicate some of that aggressive um, sp spikes in requests and see what impact this project had uh, in my environment, if it was a viable solution. I have some project organizational guidelines. Here's what I want to do to fit this outcome to my needs from my organization. I don't want to spend more because I'm trying to tune a service that already exists. I don't want to ask my customers to make any changes. I don't want to impact their experience of their, their Drupal website in any way. Um, and I also don't want to change or interfere with the websites. I'm not trying to tune or change those sites. I'm trying to, to tune how they're delivered. Basically, I want to eliminate the impact of this bot traffic and improve the website's performance. So just a brief digression into um, why Nginx, you know, what differentiates Nginx? Um, Apache is a wonderful Swiss army knife of a web server. Uh, it can do all the things. This is kind of reductive, but fundamentally, Apache's need for system resources scales linearly with web requests that it's serving. That's not 100% true, but it's, reductively, it's a good, you know, sort of summary. Um, Nginx was developed in the early 2000s to address that very issue. What do you do when you're getting thousands upon thousands of concurrent visitors and you want your web server to be able to serve them all without just chewing up system resources? Um, and that is what Nginx does, basically through an architecture that is um, asynchronous and non-blocking. It's using a single process to serve thousands of requests. Um, but Nginx is not the same thing as Apache at all. It's It serves static web content. So if you need to serve dynamic web content, you're going to have to hand off the process of generating that to a secondary tool. Um, so Nginx can, can be very powerful as a reverse proxy in front of Apache, and then you let Apache do that dynamic web generation and Nginx serves the requests. It was open sourced in 2004, and it was acquired by F5 last year. Um, I thought these metrics collected by W3 technology surveys were kind of interesting. Um, the biggest web server on the internet right now is Cloudflare, but between Apache and, and Nginx, um, if, if you look at the top 1000 busiest sites, Nginx has 40, 46% of those sites compared to Apache's 13. So that's kind of an interesting metric, I thought. Um, so essentially what I'm trying to do is I'm looking at this blog post, I'm breaking down the features and I am trying to sort of re reverse engineer what they did um, and see if I can recreate it and whether the features that they describe would be suitable for my use case. So. Here's a, a little extract from their article. Basically, they, they have a pair of Nginx servers. They're configured as a reverse proxy cache in front of Drupal. This decreases database load by serving frequently used pages. And it can also maintain uptime by serving pages when the database is down, uh, serving anonymous pages. So that's good for my use case. So I really like the sound of that. But what differentiates that from, I mean, that's just caching, right? That's classic, traditional content caching. Um, so why won't, cache, maybe that's all I need. Will caching solve this problem? Uh, it will not, and here's why. Uh, most commonly, um, a cache is small. It doesn't contain your whole site content. It's organically populated. It's being populated by requests as they come in, and it's stored usually in memory for performance reasons. And there are a lot of caching products, right? There, there's Varnish, there's Memcache, there's Redis, there's all kinds of things that are commonly in use. 
that type of cache did not solve NPR's problem with their Drupal sites, and it wouldn't solve mine because the problem traffic is a, is a high intensity, high density burst of requests that are asking for old content. They're a full site crawl. Uh, that type of, of, when those requests come in to a traditional cache, the cache has been populated organically by common requests. So those pages are not in your cache. So those requests have to be passed on to your origin server, which then has to generate that old content. It comes back down to the cache it bumps out all of your most current content that was in the cache. And now you've got a double hit on your origin server as your normal traffic continues to ask for those common pages, which the origin has to generate again. Um, so the caching alone is not going to help me. So what kind of caching would help? Um, broadly speaking, there are two approaches, right? To keeping your cached content fresh there is uh, it's the old the old joke right about cache invalidation there are two hard problems in computer science cache invalidation naming things and off by one errors so um cache invalidation is the process of the, the source of the content that dynamic content that's being updated and changing needs the mechanism to notify the cache hey replace that cached version of this content that you have with a fresher version because something's changed there's something new um, nginx plus implements that as a as an enterprise feature that they will sell you with an api they've implemented something they call the purge methods you send a purge request to the api it notifies the cache to replace that content with a newer version and since community edition of nginx contains all the core features there are other third party you know you can roll your own um, cache and validation mechanism. There are some on GitHub, I believe. And then Drupal itself is doing its own built-in caching. It has two layers, in fact, one stored in the database and one on disk. So Drupal has implemented an interesting mechanism that they uh, implement, they call it cache tags. I will move along from that for time, but it's it's interesting to read about. So then there's the that with that model, you could potentially your cache could be populated forever because you're content is notifying it when it needs to be refreshed. So that's very efficient from the cache perspective, but it's not very efficient from maybe your design and implementation perspective of getting that working. Um, then there's the, the complete opposite approach, micro caching, which is the concept that you can cache anything, but only for a moment in time. So it, it, no content that you're serving is more than one second, 10 seconds, 60 seconds out of date. There's a really nice write up about the benefits that that can have by Owen Garrett on F5, uh, of F5 on nginx.com's website. So the idea would be, say you've got a very active website and um, you set your micro cache the expiration time to 10 seconds. And in that 10 seconds, 100 requests come in for the same content. Of those 100 requests, only one needs to be generated from scratch. And the other 99 requests can be served by that cache content that's valid during that 10 second window. So that's getting a little closer. That sounds like something that I could really use. Um, but what about, so, so I'm, I'm trying to sandbox, trying to recreate NPR solution. The first thing that I encounter as I'm just setting this up and, and playing with it is that I have to deal with the fact that Drupal already has its own built-in caches. And so as a way to sort of administer that, they are configuring values in the traditional cache control headers. They've got values in cache control header, in berry header, in etag, and expires header. And as NGINX acts as a reverse proxy where your downstream client requests are terminated, then it's it, it's at that moment in time, it swaps from being a server to a client and it passes on a request to my upstream, my Apache server with those Drupal websites, gets the response back, caches it, and then serves that, that cache data to the clients. So when NGINX is acting as a client, by default, it's respecting Drupal's cache headers that is a problem for me because that's that's not really what I want. What I want is a completely transparent layer of Nginx caching that sits between Drupal's website 
and it's building cash and the clients and doesn't conflict with what Drupal's doing. So I don't want to modify those on the fly. I don't want to really hook into what Drupal is doing. So here's what I can do about that. Very simply, I can tell Nginx, ignore Drupal's cash control headers, don't modify them and pass them on unchanged to the client. At that point, my only sort of issue or responsibility is to ensure that my Nginx cache configuration does not conflict with Drupal's cache configuration in any way. So I'm trying to narrow down the be best fit of caching for this use case. I don't want to cache current content. I want to cache all content to help me deal with those random crawls. I want to put it on a disk and not in memory because my main concern is, again, those requests for unusual content. I want to improve site reliability, not necessarily just speed. Um, I'm not going to mess with cache and validation because that would get complicated and messy. I would need to get Drupal and, and Nginx kind of interfacing about that. Um, so that leaves some variant of micro caching. My main goal is to not allow incoming requests to be passed on indiscriminately to the upstream Drupal server. So part of the winning combination involves some of these directives. And what they boil down to is notifying Nginx when it's okay to serve stale or out of date cached content. That sounds bad. That sounds like something you don't want to do. The reason it's okay is because you're micro caching. None of your cache content is going to be older than a few seconds or a few minutes uh, in time. Uh, at that point, it goes stale, and the next request is going to prompt an updated copy to be downloaded and uh, replace that in the Nginx cache. Um, so how are we going to accomplish that? We're going to ignore Drupal's cache control headers. We're going to select uh, content to cache based on a scheme that is appropriate for anonymous page views. We're only going to cache the get and head methods. We're not going to cache posts or anything like that. Um, we're going to turn on proxy cache lock. So if a burst of requests come in all for the same content, only one of them will be passed on to the upstream and the subsequent requests will not be passed on. They will be told to wait until the upstream is done generating a fresh copy and then they will all get that fresh copy. We're going to cache aggressively. We're going to say proxy cache min uses one. First time you see it, cache it. Um, we're going to update in the background. So it's okay to serve an incoming request with stale content if your upstream is busy updating the cache, if your upstream is timing out and not responding to you, if it's in an error state, go ahead and serve your request with stale content. And then you can even configure it down to the detailed level of saying for any specific HTTP response that comes from your upstream, in that case, serve stale content. Um, so I'll, I don't want to, I'll skip ahead kind of for time, but then what do you do about, what do you do about people who are going to authenticate. You're, in our case, a small number of users who do need to authenticate and log in. You make provision for them by ensuring that as soon as a person begins the process of authenticating to the Drupal website, their session, their requests, their traffic is not stored in the cache and is not served from the cache. So you just exempt that authenticated user entirely. Um, and so you, you do not have any danger of serving cached content to an authenticated user or serving an authenticated user's content from your cache to an anonymous user. It will not happen. So that's good as far as it goes. Uh, it's very helpful. I've already created a sort of a, a screen, a helpful um, a, a sort of a blocker that's going to slow down the ability of any given um, traffic to reach my upstream server, because there are a lot of conditions under which Nginx is just going to go ahead and um, serve them from the cache. But that hasn't yet addressed the bot cache portion of the project. So that, that's the fun part. This is what NPR developed. Basically, to that design, they have added another layer, a mechanism of just examining the user agent of every request matching it up to a list. And if they evaluate that that is a bot, they're going to divert that request away from their upstream entirely and send it to a static, fully pre-populated cache that they call bot cache. So in their design, um, 
Nginx is also helping reduce load in a number of ways, right? It's the reverse proxy. You're terminating the client's TLS connection there on your Nginx server, and you're terminating that keep alive session, and you're caching. So Apache no longer has to worry about that. Um, and then at this point, they're diverting some traffic into a bot cache server based on the user agent. They've got an in-memory high-speed cache on their main Nginx setup and a, di a slower disk cache full of every page on their bot cache. So that's, how do you do that? It's incredibly simple in Nginx. Um, using map directives, you simply inspect that user agent. Uh, the map directive allows you to set uh, to, to, to set the value of a variable based on a different variable. Um, so if I look at the user agent and I say by default, I'm going to set, set my bot check variable to off. But if that user agent is found in a list or matches a string or a regular expression in a list that I have maintained or created, then I'm going to set that to on. Then depending on whether bot check is set to on or off, I'm going to determine which upstream source of content to direct that request to. In, in the default case, in the off case, I'm just going to send that request to my Drupal server if the content isn't available in the cache. If it was a bot user agent, I'm diverting it to bot cache. So that's great as far as it goes, but I, that isn't really going to solve my problem um, for a number of reasons. Um, can I, can, so far, so far I've replicated NPR's project, which is great, and the essential features were free. They were all part of Nginx Community Edition, but for my use case, so to, to get a test, uh, a sense of how this would really work in production, I look at a bunch of logs. I look at, uh, I don't know, a month worth of logs or a couple months, and I discover that only 7% of my requests would I be able to unambiguously identify as a bot user agent. So at that point, that leaves 93% of traffic that wouldn't be addressed by this bot cache solution at all. And for those reasons that we talked about with the, with the cache, that they would still generate load on the upstream because those rarely used pages are not up to date and current in my, in my normal cache. So I don't like that. That's not solving my problem. And then I look at, say, an example, one of the, the most aggressive uh, uh, crawls that I saw was like 20 different IP addresses from a, a cloud hosting provider, and they all had a valid current up-to-date user agent that you would expect from a browser. So that's, this bot cache is not going to save me from that traffic at all. Um, even if I reverse the logic and say, tried to create some list of known friendly user agents, I'm still going to misclassify some visitors. And again, that doesn't really sound like what I want to do. Um, here are a, a summary from NPR's article of the characteristics that I do want from their bot cache project. I, I don't want to clear um, less frequently used content from my cache. I want to cache the whole site, even if some pages are not accessed very often. Because of that, I want to cache it on disk in a file system, just because uh, RAM would get expensive really quickly. And then the logic, if a request is going to place undue load on my upstream, I just want to serve it from the cache, even if it may be out of date. So what if I could configure all of those benefits of this bot cache design into my primary singular cache and limit traffic based on the rate of requests over time instead of on a list of user agents. So um, as soon as I asked the right question, I found the answer. That is already implemented in Nginx, and it's just called limit request zone. Basically, it's a directive that can be used to limit the processing rate of requests coming from a single IP. So this is not the same as limiting connections, and it's not the same as placing an overall limit on your server. This is saying per IP, rate limit how fast we will serve their requests. And so that's what I'm able to do, just very simply. Starting at the bottom on this slide, um, I configure a limit request zone. Normally that would just look at the IP address, but I've added a layer to this. Um, I've put a variable called external, and then I've applied a rate limit, let's say an arbitrary value, like five requests per second. 
Um, and then if some requests from some IP address exceeds that rate, they're going to get returned an arbitrary status like 429, which says, no, slow down too fast. And there's, there's more nuance to it than that that I have not included here. Like you can configure burstiness so that say you want to make allowances for um, a friendly or a, a valid request that just happens to briefly exceed your rate limit, you can configure in a, a burst directive. So it's okay. They don't get rate limited if they briefly exceed and then go back to a more a, a rate that is lower than your limit. But what, what do I do about the fact that I never, ever, ever want to hit valid customer visits with a rate limit? That's not what I want to happen at all. I want to ensure it doesn't happen. Our organization acts as a network, uh, an internet service provider to a very specific group of organizations. So for our customers location where they are doing business, where they might have a large number of computers that could conceivably all re make a request at the same moment in time from behind the same IP, I know what those IPs are. And I'm always going to know what they are. So I leverage the fact that I have that information to basically exempt known customer site IPs and also their sister organizations from this rate limit. And at that point, I can make a very good assumption based on other factors that the rest of my good or valid or the traffic that I don't want to rate limit is typically coming from distributed IPs. Um, people on home internet service providers um, where you're not getting a large number of people. So um, again, I did that with a map directive. I, I gave an exemption list of IPs that would be exempt from this rate limit, and then everyone else defaulted into the rate limit. So that's great. At that point, I've got a project. I've got a cache it is fully populated with every possible page. I can repopulate it on the, on the schedule that is suitable to me. And every single request that comes in is going to be greeted with a combination of either um, being passed and either hitting the cache, it's being served from the cache, notifying the cache, hey, go get a fresh copy. Um, if, the, if, the, if there are too many requests, we'll serve out a stale request while we're waiting for that upstream to respond. Or if the requests are just exceeding a reasonable rate, which I have pre-configured arbitrarily, their request will get turned away. So that's sort of generation one. Generation two of making that ideal, in my opinion, would be to move that rate limiting component from my reverse proxy at the edge onto my origin server at the upstream. So the cache and everything else remains at my edge server. Then all of those requests are passed to the upstream when they don't meet, you know, they don't, they're not a cache hit, but the upstream enforces the rate limit. The reason that that could be so cool is that that would return that arbitrary, whatever response that I choose to return, um, 429 or something else, I could include that response in my proxy cache, stale, while, whatever directive. So I could say, if you see this, this response that I'm specifically returning when the rate limit is invoked, go ahead and serve a stale copy from the cache. Then literally no one's ever being blocked everyone's always getting served. The only people seeing maybe older content are those crawlers that are being unfriendly to our system resources. So that, I like the sound of that a lot. Um, so now jumping on to just the, the little practical implementation parts. This was interesting information that NPR shared. They, how are they gonna populate that bot cache that they created? They started by using wget with the recursive um, option, but th they had a problem such that they were creating new content faster than they could crawl it. Uh, so much so that they would miss 30% of their content by crawling recursively. And they weren't creating content 30% faster, but the indexing of the pages was changing. And so whole pages of content were being missed. Um, so very simple solution. They just do a database dump. They ask Drupal, hey, tell me a list of all of your pages, your URLs. And then they feed that list into a wget crawler. So that's great. I can pre-populate my cache even with those less popular or less frequently accessed pages. I can set a cache, a separate one for every website, for every customer. I could repopulate it on a schedule or on demand. And I can uh, leverage the fact that I can just ask Drupal to tell me for a list of what pages to crawl. 
Um, this is kind of a simplified example. You can really, WGET is surprisingly flexible. And one of the main reasons that I didn't do something else, I just went ahead and used WGET to populate my cache was this nifty directive, page requisites. By default, WGET actually isn't going to download every single asset that a browser would download to display a page. It's not going to get some of those assets that are external and you want to populate your cache with all of them. So page requisites um, will do that. You can set your own user agent so you can exclude that from your logging or your metrics. You can rate limit your crawl. Um, this base directive looks redundant, but it's a necessary prerequisite to this input file directive where you are feeding in the appropriate list of site URLs um, for that specific domain. So that's populating the cache. And then what about um, the project of deployment? Um, so I, I build out all these configurations and staging. I automated building the configuration files just sort of like a, a best practice because you can't you can't have any fuzzy thinking if you're scripting something. It's going to do exactly what you tell it. So by building the actual configs with um, scripting, that helped me make sure I was doing what I meant to do. For, for rolling this out in front of our existing service, I also wrote scripts for every step of that process. And for each script that I wrote, I wrote a mirror image script to roll it back, uh, to roll a config change back. And then I also automated a test that would tell me check for success and notify me if that if that expected configuration change was failing. And then I set up a runbook that enumerated everything I would need to do to deploy it. And then I went over that several times. And then very importantly, I left in time in my maintenance window in case I needed to roll it back. You think I missed something? I did. Um, so uh, silliest thing too. I implemented this in a maintenance window. It worked great for about an hour, and then all of a sudden, it stopped dead. And all sites requests were failing. So what? So I used those rollback scripts that I had written, undid my changes, uh, stepped back, look at it, and I quickly recognized what I had done. I had failed to um, whitelist a an IP address that was moving in the fail to ban of the server that was losing that IP address. So I was able to then schedule a new maintenance window and use the scripts I'd written to uh, put it all back in place the next time. So let's see here. Is it going to proceed? Okay, so there's a little bit of automation that's kind of handy just to make this, this um, server be self-maintaining. Um, I think probably the most interesting one was I implemented a custom service. So Drupal is doing its own caching, right? Internal to itself. And Nginx isn't interfering with that. It is passing its um, cache related headers onto the browser, the client that's requesting that site. So our um, web developer has enabled a feature of Drupal called rebuild cache. And that means that any customer, any authenticated user who's interacting with their website and seeing some unexpected results can press this rebuild cache button to clear Drupal's two built-in caches. So in order to make this Nginx cache as transparent as possible, I implemented a little service on the Nginx server that watches for invocations of that rebuild cache button in Drupal and mirrors that, clears Nginx's cache for that website, just so that the user um, will never see any anything unexpected. The, if, if Drupal's cache gets cleared, Nginx's cache gets cleared. And then I also schedule that website for a uh, the, the, the cache to be repopulated when that happens. You can accomplish that with any automation flavor that suits your style. I used Bash because it makes me happy. Okay, so instrumentation. You can really do quite a bit to instrument um, uh, Nginx. I did two levels of logging, partly because I had a, a locally installed Matomo instance that I had been importing um, Apache vhost combined logs, and I wanted data continuity in that. So I set up one level of Nginx logs that were gonna have the exact same data so I could keep getting my nice Matomo web analytics dashboards. And then I implemented a second set of logging with instrumentation about the cache and instrumentation that described performance on um, 
a timing of communication between Nginx and the Apache upstream, how long each step of that request and response process took. A nice benefit of having that instrumentation is that you can pass it on to Nginx Amplify. This is their SaaS monitoring offering. Um, it's just a Python agent that you can install locally in Nginx and it sends your monitoring data to an Amplify dashboard. Um, monitors the operating system, Nginx, um, PHP, and MySQL. And it also takes advantage of that instrumentation that you have configured in your Nginx logs, if any. And that is free for up to five agents um, in their community edition. And yes, I did cherry pick that nice screenshot when there was 100% application health score. Um, so quickly, a thought just about benchmarking. Uh, I think my biggest takeaway, just fooling about with this was don't conflate environment factors with server performance. So your benchmarking results, obviously, in a staging environment are gonna be quite different from in production because you're removing some of those elements um, that could introduce confusion. I'm, in staging, I'm testing over the LAN. In production, I would be testing over um, some network um, length that I can't really control. So Apache Bench is a nifty tool for testing anonymous content, which is what I have to deal with. So that's good as far as it goes, except that it's only testing one domain at a time, one page at a time, right? So in a way, I almost feel like those results would be weighted in favor of caching. I mean, that's okay. That is what we're testing. I didn't need to mess with something like JMeter or something where I could configure. I, I wasn't trying to benchmark logging in or anything like that. Just how does Apache compare with Nginx with a cache? serving these web pages. But Apache Bench is a single threaded application. So I thought, could I feed Apache Bench to something like GNU Parallels, which can implement different um, scripts that are single threaded in parallel so that you can take advantage of all your system cores. You could also distribute those jobs across multiple servers or multiple machines. And indeed, I was able to do that. Um, in fact, I found a really detailed write up about it with some good suggestions on a blog by Simon Holywell. So I have the, the link to that in there if you'd like to look at it. So just to compare, a few um, tests done in staging versus in production. This is in staging. So all of the system resources are equal between the two endpoints and there's no network delay, it's on the LAN. Um, I did a time-based rather than number-based test. And for my Nginx, server, Apache Bench actually maxed out the number of requests that it will perform during a period of time. It hit 50,000 requests and it just quit. It's like, okay, you're, you're done. That's enough from you. But it was six, more than six times faster to have this configuration of caching on Nginx versus just natively requesting Apache. Keeping in mind, that's with Drupal's caching enabled. So for both of these tests, Drupal's own built-in caching is on. This is the, the performance that I'm seeing with Nginx. Um, and in production, it was uh, under just under three times faster, which is still great. Um, I was very pleased with that amount of improvement. So I've, uh, looking back at the project, I have answered all of the questions that I set out for myself. I was satisfied that um, I had customized the project so that it would actually suit our organization's needs. I just have a couple of questions left. Um, what about, what did I not know to ask and what impact is this having? So I think my takeaway was that documentation is very important, but staging is even more important. Often I would learn about something as I'm researching this, I'm setting it up, I think, oh, okay, this is what will happen. This is not what would happen. Uh, the, the directives would interact in ways that I didn't expect. So reading the documentation was one thing, staging it and seeing what happened was another thing. Um, there's an awesome community-driven listserv um, that, that Nginx offers. I've got a link for that there too. And it's really valuable. It's very active every day. And just reading that um, is pretty educational. So my takeaways um, from this project, what does your organization need? You solve for that. Don't you don't necessarily have to um, adopt what is a best practice or the standard practice for a particular technology. 
um, adapt it so that it's actually meeting your business case. Um, instrument everything because somebody will ask you for that information and that somebody will be you and document everything for the same reason. Do plan for failure and have a rollback plan ready to go, not just in your head, but hopefully automated and tested because at some point something will go wrong. And then what does success look like um, for our particular implementation? Since this has been in production, there have been no more incidents caused by traffic. Hmm. So I'd call that a success. It has dealt with that traffic problem. We've got less spend on the server resources because Apache needs so much fewer resources to serve the same requests to the same clients in a timely manner. We've got reduced administrative demand because I no longer need to, in the future, our web developer doesn't need to ask her customers to execute a DNS change. I've got this reverse proxy and it now owns our, our the IP address for those sites. And so we can um, migrate them forward as needed. Maintenance impact is reduced. I can turn off my Apache upstream server. All of the pages are pre-populated and regularly repopulated in the cache. They will go right on being served while I do maintenance upstream. Um, this request response time, there's a lot of kinds of metrics. That metric is the length of time it takes Nginx to communicate a request it's received to Apache and get that back and send it on to the client. And that has um, improved significantly. And then you can see there are just some metrics. Um, these metrics, these cache performance metrics would vary wildly with how, how you're configuring your cache. What's your cache validity lifetime? What is, um, are you micro caching? What are some of those rules? But we've got a 50% hit rate, which I think is just massive for a micro caching implementation of this kind. And authenticated users, um, which always bypass the cache, they're not really adding any load because that's only 2% of the overall requests. So I have included a few resources, links to resources that were really helpful in investigating and, and experimenting with these technologies and setting up this project. Um, thank you so much for your, your time and your attention. Um, come and say hi to me on Twitter. I just love that dumpster fire uh, or send me an email and uh, the slides are available online. Thank you. Great job, Jessica. I, I agree with you. Twitter is certainly a dumpster fire. <laughs> I love it anyway. I can't help myself. It's so bad. Well, you um, had a great presentation there. It looks like Nixie needs to unmute. Well, there we go. <laughs> I, I went the whole conference without doing that. Um, <laughs> Most it, said thing during the pen, well, 2020, right? <laughs> right, without speaking while unmuted. I just wanted to know what Princess Bride video that was since you didn't get a chance to play it. Was that Never Make a Bet with the Sicilian when death is on the line or? Oh, I'm sorry. On my, sc on my screen, it did play, so I didn't. Oh, really? Oh. It, it's, it's just, um, I, I do not think that means what you think it means. Oh, yes. I, I maybe it did play. I just wanted to hear you do the reenactment. <laughs> <laughs> With this, this is a depiction of me trying to understand the documentation. Yeah. That's not what that does. Yeah. So, yeah, I have some questions. I don't know if we're how we're rolling here. You, I will let Warner. Um, I defer to Warner. But I'd we say we could probably time. fit in one, but I mean, we okay. are. Really oh no, one. I okay, used up my see. time. I used up my time. Oh, does that mean you don't want questions? No, I will. I will accept. Okay. Sorry, I didn't leave any time for that. Okay, how about this? I'll ask two questions and you can pick. Um, what's the difference between Nginx and Nginx Plus, like the commercial license? And then um, I've always been a big fan of NPR programming with the open source community view on openness. What open tools does NPR use internally? I like both of those questions. You can decide that. That's an awesome question. I have no idea what NPR uses internally because my whole perspective is just reading their SRE blog. But the difference between Engine Plus and Community Edition is Plus is the Enterprise Edition and there's a whole list of features. You can find the comparison on nginx.com. They actually, that's a great source of documentation for both editions because they're really good about specifying this feature is free for all, this feature is paid. Gotcha. You let me know if I have more. I, I have more. <laughs> well, we should probably move on. I, I know this next part of our program is going to be tighter, but thanks so much, Jessica.
really appreciated your presentation and your insight.